fast, accurate. You're watching WSBT 22 News at 530. This is a special operation education crisis in the classroom town hall. Tonight, what's keeping our children from learning? We're exposing the barriers to education, both inside and outside the classroom in your local community. Thank you for joining us for this special operation education town hall. I'm Kristen Bean. Together tonight, we are changing the narrative about the barriers to education our community's children are facing. We've gathered together some of our area's top education leaders to talk about what we can all be doing to help. But first, by better understanding the challenges and struggles these children are facing, we might be able to reach those who are hardest to reach. John Galinsky is a man of few words, but he has a story to tell. Do you remember anything about that, that uh, day? Partial, like half the day. That day was August 23rd of last year. Police were called to McNaughton Park in Elkhart because someone found two teens by the river unresponsive. So somebody saw you. Yeah. Called 911. Police ambulance came. They revive you with Narcan? They tried Narcan at first and then had to go to two different other things, CPR and then the electrical thing. Tragically, Galinsky's friend died. When did you find out about your friend? When they was reviving me. That day has haunted Galinsky and that trauma will likely stay with him. But he's getting support in an important place. So you would describe him as a success story? Yes, yeah, and he pushed himself so hard to get to where he's at. Yes, he's an amazing success story. Galinsky is a senior at Elkhart Academy. So we're the alternative high school program for Elkhart Community Schools. Sure. Principal Brian Hammontree says all of the students at Elkhart Academy end up there because the traditional school isn't working for them and they're on track to drop out. I believe students' behavior is trying to communicate something to us. For some students, like Galinsky, their trauma deeply impacts their life. There are students that walk through the door each and every day that have a lot on their plate. They're carrying heavy burdens, right, and they, they just need some help carrying them. Had you asked me a year ago at this time, I might have said that John was a hard to reach student, that I wasn't sure we were going to get to that point. But I feel like because we, even feeling that way, we don't give up. Maybe the lesson then for all of us watching, you know, from the outside is like you can't give up. I'm thankful that's what we believe here. Galinsky will graduate in June. He wants to be a mechanic. He credits his success to the people at Elkhart Academy, his family, and the friend he'll never forget. I've just been trying to stay out of stuff, keep to myself, work, do my school work, and try to graduate, just accomplish stuff. And you feel like, in part, you're doing it for him? Yeah. Story today to show that sometimes what a student is experiencing isn't always visible or easy to understand and that those things can be barriers. That's why for the next half hour, we're sitting down with the experts. Our panel tonight is comprised of the people who are seeing the needs within our school communities and working to break the barriers that are keeping our kids from succeeding. Hear from Lindsay Brander. Brander is the Assistant Superintendent of Student Services at Elkhart Community Schools. You're going to hear from Dr. Davian Lewis. He's the Chief Executive Officer at the South Bend Empowerment Zone. That's a group of schools on South Bend's west side that are part of a transformational plan. Stephanie Stewart Bridges. Stephanie is the Director of African American Student and Parent Services at the South Bend Community School Corporation. And Seth Moss. Seth is co founder and president of Five Star Life. It's a nonprofit focused on addressing student dropout rates, suicide violence, and mental health issues by changing kids' mindsets. So thank you all so much for being here today. We really appreciate it. I want to start by defining who we are talking about tonight. We're focusing on reaching students who are hardest to reach, but I think really the question tonight is, what are some of the barriers that children in our community are experiencing that might be keeping them from getting that education, from taking that next step in life? Thanks for hosting this, first of all. Um, I think everything goes back to, you know, you think about kids that are the hardest to reach, they're 
in a gang, they're experimenting with drugs, they're in detention centers, they're getting into trouble. It all goes back to fatherlessness. You can call it fa you know, family attachments or lack thereof, but when kids are in a position where they don't have somebody that's pouring into them, they learn that they have very little value, right? So, so why am I gonna value education when I don't value myself? And how can I value education if I have nobody holding me accountable? And so I think those attachments create the, the, the true barriers and everything else is kind of a, a ripple effect off that. One of the things that we talked with social workers about and the principal at Elkhart Academy is that, you know, all students in a way really have something, you know, like all behavior indicates something, you know, uh, is, is them trying to communicate something. And so I wonder, are there the list of things that make students hard to reach might be very long. There, there's not just one thing. Yeah, uh, uh, rates of depression and anxiety are unprecedented right now in our students. That can severely impact motivation. Uh, they're feeling hopeless about the future, so they really don't want to engage in school, engage with their friends and families, and it, it overall will impact how they succeed. And I wonder poverty, homelessness, children in foster care, um, things that they themselves can't control. You know, it's like outside factors. Yeah, so... You know, one of the things I like to remind folks is that our schools are essentially a microcosm of our community. Mm -hmm. So whatever is happening in a community is going to manifest and play out in a school. And so if in that community there is high rates of poverty or crime, violence, uh, if you have a large segment of the population that is uh, unhoused, all of these things are going to manifest in schools. And so what I like to tell folks is that just as how in a community you will bring together a variety of different resources, you'll have the mayor's office, the police department, fire, so on and so forth, our schools as microcosms of communities also require the same varied resources that you would have in any community. And I might just add as well that young people today are dealing with things that probably none of us had to deal with when we were growing up. Many of the young people today are uh, income earners for their families. Uh, they provide childcare if, uh, depending on the family dynamics. If So it's just, it's just a lot going on for young people today that they have to navigate, and we really haven't really scratched the surface yet. And I wonder how this impacts kids in the classroom as well. Well, I think the big, another thing that contributes to that is that historical stigma around mental health. So it impacts kids in the classroom because they can hide, because so many times they've been told, get over it, there's nothing wrong with you. Um, just barriers to be able to address what's really going on with them. And so they have a tendency to hide in various different behaviors that they can't even recognize or explain. And so that shows up in the classroom. Yeah. That's the very first place where we have the social expectation to adapt to change in a positive way. And a lot of times they don't have the capacity or the ability to do that because they don't have the privilege of um, some of the home lives that, that we've had. And so it creates this barrier for them and their inability to communicate how they're feeling as well. It's and, and I want to say, too, a lot of those that you talk about cause trauma, you know, and we've heard the word trauma so often. Um, and that actually leads us into our next topic, trauma. Mm -hmm. Who is struggling with this? What is it? And how is it impacting our kids? We're going to talk about that next. So make sure you stay with us. When did you find out about your friend? When they was reviving me. Like you, in that time, they were telling you that he wasn't going to make it? I seen him. Regardless of what the trauma is, I think the response is, how do we help them build resilience? Thank you again for joining us on this special Operation Education Town Hall. You just saw Elkhart senior John Galinsky talk about the moment he found out his friend wasn't going to make it and his high school principal calling it trauma. So the question for our panelists is what is trauma and how does it impact the kids in our area? Yeah, uh, great question. So I, I'll start off by saying in, in various ways, all of us as human beings experience trauma. Uh, we navigate and deal with that trauma in, in different ways. But for young people, uh, unfortunately, they don't necessarily have the skills or the vocabulary 
to best navigate that trauma. Some of that is cultural, some of that is generational. So you think about, you know, you might hear your parents or grandparents say, well, when I was your age, we just sucked it up, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and some of it is cultural as well. Um, different cultures have different practices around how we speak about our feelings. We just kind of pass things uh, on to the next generation. So uh, it, it's important to note that, again, we all experience trauma. And for young people, it's all about helping them to develop the skill sets and the vocabulary in order to best navigate that. And what is trauma informed? We hear this all the time, like, oh, this school is a trauma informed school or I'm teaching trauma informed. What does that mean? I think it really means that trauma can show up in the behaviors that we see in the classroom, all behaviors, communication, and being aware of how our own trauma will impact the way we interact with our students because relationships we feed off each other. Uh, so the more we can be informed about the things that our students are experiencing, the more we can help them and get them into that learning state where they're able to learn and grow as humans. And I wonder how that trauma impacts kids in the classroom. You know, we see um, test scores. We see, for, as an outsider, the data, the school achievement, right? Is that also, you know, an indicator of trauma? Well, I think when you think about it, a kid can't learn if they can't think. So when mm -hmm. a person is, I mean, think about yourself when you're stressed out, how well can you retain information? So it's important to consider as children when they don't have the language to navigate what they're feeling, when they come to a classroom, they may not be able to express how they feel the way we expect them to. So it comes out a lot of times like aggression. So when a student is really dysregulated, it's important for the adult to be regulated mm -hmm. so they can create the capacity in the classroom for that student to gain the knowledge that they need to. What is the message, I think, then for people out there who, you know, you can't always see trauma, right? But as a community, you can be more, maybe more empathetic and sympathetic. Um, like what, what maybe should us as outsiders be doing? Well, I think awareness is a big key, just being aware that, man, life is tough. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us can agree. I mean, who would who'd want to sign up to be a kid growing up in today's culture? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it is so hard. So they have so much pressure. And so I think, you know, suck it up, buttercup is the message we've been, we've been giving kids, and it's not working. So we have to be aware that, man, if we can just help these kids know that, listen, I hear you. Here are some tools. You can get through this. We all go through tough times. Here's some tools to help you be resilient. Yeah, and you know, trauma care closely resembles mental health care. So we're talking about mental health care next when our special operation education town hall continues. Make sure to stay with us. Now, your accurate storm alert weather forecast with meteorologist Lynette Grant. We'll get you right back to that town hall in a little bit, but I did want to bring you a quick update on what we're dealing with weather-wise. This is not new information. The fact that we have winter storm warnings for Berrien County, Cass County, Elkhart County, and parts of St. Joseph County. But the thing and the situation that is constantly developing this evening is where those bands of heavy snow are. Right now, we're seeing several pockets of that heavier snow through St. Joseph County in Michigan, Cass County, Elkhart County, and then just pockets of snow in Berrien and St. Joseph County. Now, these intense bands through Cass County, Elkhart County, this is what we're going to watch for through the rest of the evening. There's more lake effect snow to the north, so we still have several more hours. The lake effect snow limiting visibility to less than a mile in some places. It's less than a mile in Niles, right at a mile in South Bend and locally even lower. Winds from the northwest at around 15 to 20 miles per hour. That's blowing the snow, creating that low visibility. Temperature is going to fall below freezing overnight. That is going to create some icy conditions. Now, the additional snowfall we're expecting to see, probably two to four inches of snow in our eastern communities. We're talking Cassopolis, Elkhart, Goshen, Three Rivers. Somewhere in that circle is where we're going to see some pretty intense snowfall rates through the night. You can see though that the snow overall comes to an end after midnight, but those temperatures in the 20s in a few minutes, we'll talk about the impacts you'll have out the door tomorrow. Kristen, back to you. Thanks, Lynette. We are continuing to talk about reaching students who are hard to reach in today's special operation education town hall. And I wanna talk now about mental health. There has been more focus on mental health, of course, since the pandemic. But the question is, is that because we're seeing more mental health challenges or is there just more of a spotlight about it? And we're talking about it more. I think it's both. I think there's the destigmatization de de of mental health. Um, it's more out there, kids are more aware of the challenges that they're facing. And there's also a lot more 
uh, depression and anxiety that our students are experiencing. But with that, uh, we've also come to realize how much we are lacking in resources. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are not enough um, uh, mental health providers um, who can meet the varied needs of not just students, but all people. Um, and, and that's something that's really come to light as a result of this new spotlight on mental health as well. So what does that tell us maybe about what role schools and the community play in helping the kids? I think it's critical. I think um, our kids go to school every day. It's the most consistent arena they have to be reinforced and affirmed and creating the possibility for them to receive some of the support that they need in um, a school setting. It allows us to meet um, needs that otherwise might never get addressed. So we noticed that from the pandemic, kids being at home all day, um, not having those um, extra touch points that it was um, harmful for them. So it's important for us to kind of consider how we might build that capacity day in and day out in a school setting to create the opportunity to meet those needs. And what about the adults in our community? I mean, they're the kids, or they're the people teaching our kids, right? Or welcoming our kids into schools or programs. Um, you know, what what is their role in keeping themselves healthy and our role in helping them? Sure, and this is kind of kind of a cool point. You know, as an organization, we're a nonprofit. We're not a school, so we're in partnership with everybody here. These are my my my, my peers, and one of the things that we do is just offering professional development to help come alongside of teachers and parents. Programs for both to help parents step into that role and be comfortable having those conversations, and then reaffirming their kids and how do we tackle this issue? So I think those are some key points. We actually just launched a series on mental health, how to help kids break through in mental health. So it's another tool we're offering. And, that, and that's really important because when you think about it, the, uh, you know, the home is your first classroom mm -hmm. and your parent is your first teacher. So building the skill set and the capacity of the adults at home to support the kiddos uh, better prepares them for when they go out uh, into our schools. And so, you know, Seth brought up a really good point because these community partnerships, going back to my earlier point about the need to bring in very community resources, Partners like Seth uh, really helps to fill that gap for all of us as uh, school system leaders. Um, and so whether it's them or uh, the Beacon Center or Oaklawn, what have you, we really uh, have to rely on a variety of different partners to meet the needs of the kiddos in our buildings. We'll get final thoughts on reaching hard to reach students when we come back right after this break. Thank you for watching our special Operation Education Town Hall on WSBT 22. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us as we talk about the barriers to education. We have just about a minute left, and I want to ask each of our experts tonight, what can we do as a community to help the children in our area who are dealing with challenges that we can't see or are hard to understand? I think it's important to have a lot of grace. So just remember that they're kids, and we, have, we live in a world where we have adultified little people mm -hmm. in a way that is really not reasonable. And so we have to create the space to allow kids to be kids. And that goes back to, you know, the parents being the first teacher, um, how we look at things on social media. We also have to put some responsibility on some of the adults to create that space. And uh, Seth, I know you wanted to say something. Oh, just don't, don't let the conversation stop here. Go to our website, fivestarlife.org. Get involved. We have a weekly show, podcast, they can tune in to learn more about this conversation. And Lindsay? I would say to parents, don't be afraid to advocate for your children. Yeah, very good message. As adults, we are all responsible. These are all our kids. And so if you are riding around, you're in a convenience store, you see a young person doing something you're not supposed to do, be that parent. We're all responsible. These are all our kiddos. Yeah, good messages. Thank you guys so much. Thank you to our panel and thank you to our viewers. That, of course, is a wrap on our special Operation Education Town Hall. The News at 6 is next with our top stories and the current winter storm warning. Have a great night.